You know, I was just thinking when you were talking that you make it be so cool, so fashionable to be a geek girl, <laughs> if you will, right? Yet you talked about the declining numbers in um, computer science. And uh, so two-part question, did you ever have an identity crisis about being a geek girl? And is that at the heart of why women are not taking to computer science, even though it's lucrative, even though it probably is more democratic about gender and probably provides you that work-life balance far more easily. But yet, despite all of that, there is a reducing number. So your own identity, if any, on uh, questioning this being on the frontier yeah. and other women, you know? No, no, absolutely. I mean, I think there's many reasons why the numbers have been declining. I think, first and foremost, I think tech in general, and if you look at the tech industry globally, you know, wherever you are, but a tech role in a tech industry, right? If you're a programmer or you're an engineer in a technology company, is seen as very alienating. I think it is very isolating, very alienating. Long hours, you work by yourself, no one really helps you because everyone's just super focused on what they do. These are all things that are, I think, very uh, intimidating, in many ways alienating for women, and I think isolating. And so women choose not to do that and you know choose other fields. Actually, the data gets worse. I think in, in the US, again, my numbers are US-based, 14% um, of graduating undergrads are computer science, uh, are women. In in engineering fields, in the STEM fields. Uh, but if you track that 14%, you know, the number is fairly small. If you track them 10 years, a decade uh, long, only 3% remain actually in a tech job in the tech industry. So even the ones that are graduating with a technical degree after 10 years choose to have careers away. And you know, and then mid-career, women leave their jobs at three times faster rate than men do. Um, so, I mean, the numbers are just staggeringly bad. And I think um, there's many reasons for that. I think the companies have a responsibility to make environments such that women can work, you know, whether it's flexibility or you know, encouraging people to be who they are without fitting a certain mold. Um, you know, in the Valley, there is definitely a notion of, there's a stereotype of a programmer. You're technically, you know, to be really technically considered a 10X engineer or very fast, you have to fit this programmer mold. And, you know, I mean, firstly, it, it has the word bro instead of, you know, I don't know what the equivalent oh. would be. <laughs> um, so I think these are all things that I think push women away from the tech industry. You know, talking about talent and so forth, I wanted to maybe draw a couple of viewpoints from the audience. And we have Vanita here, and she's been here in uh, India for seven years now, right, Vanita? And uh, at IBM, and you know, it's uh, uh, a name that gets as hollowed as it does uh, from memories, right? So, love to hear your uh, thoughts and uh, experiences and a few comments on what uh, Padma said and talent in context of India. We have talked talent in the context of US and global, but love to hear your thoughts. When you look at technology, technology is not the end state. It's just a means to an end. And when I, mean, I look at India and what we've done and where we need to go, um, I also chair NIT Suratkal, which is a technology institution by accident, not <laughs> by design. And, uh, and what I find is when you look at this next wave, uh, programming has gotten a lot easier. It's mm. not Fortran and JCL mm. anymore. So when I look at what we are doing as a company, uh, it's all APIs and someone with a context and a problem to solve can use the technology and solve it fairly quickly. So when I look at our, our educational system, and this is what internally as well I've gotten really passionate about, is you've got to have almost, we're looking at two, two groups of people. One group of people, which in India we need to do a lot more to drive people to do PhDs and deep research, because the kind of real innovation that you're talking about, whether it's in hardware or software, transportation, it's a step function change. Mm -hmm. It's not incremental. So that requires depth. And we find far too many of our really smart IIT going graduates want to write a mobile app, mm. as opposed to doing real research and building new things that drive that level of innovation and IP creation. The other area where we need scale is people who can build context. Use a context so you then use the technology because today we, uh, we have uh, you know, a, our platform called Watson. Mm -hmm. 
It has, uh, it was one API three years ago, it's 28 APIs today, it's on a cloud. So unlike 50 years ago when you had to go to a room and submit cards and have this computer which was as big as this room, now anyone sitting anywhere in the world can access the most advanced cognitive APIs and write that. So if you're gonna do that, you need to have an understanding of a domain. It goes back to how you talked about. Without a domain and without solving a problem in a domain, it's just technology. And that's where I think, so I'm trying to now look at, encourage people, our system is still somewhat rigid, is have a, a, you know, a, an educational background orientation that gives you more context whether it's about industry, whether it's about a domain, whether it's about understanding financials. And, and that's something, particularly as we look at, I'm doing engineering and I'm doing engineering in a very narrow way. So, so I think for us as India, the, the great news is the demographic dividend. When I left India, you know, what in the early 80s, it was, we always thought of population as a problem. We were part of the Malthusian theory. Today, it is the demographic dividend. But I think for the demographic dividend to really, really be monetized, and especially as we look at the startups, you can't think of it as just that, that quick win. That quick win is important, but you got to look at how do you sustain that value. And sustaining that value until we get someone that keeps us, you know, sort of gives us a daily download and says, okay, you can, comes from broadening, I think, the education. So I would say where we have to is, some of us really need to go deeper, and then we got the, the folks that are studying and want to remain a bit more context. I think those are probably, when I look at hiring and when I look at educational systems, I think those are probably my two most important observations and takeaways for now. So, Mohan, you talked about you know, your passion, or one of your passions being how do you take science and research from lab or university or institute or whatever, and how do we commercialize it, productize it, and you know, bridge that gap? I mean, that's always happened, but it has happened somewhat slowly. Now maybe that's getting crunched. Uh, and and even, even then, you know, that thought remains more in the US kind of horizon than in India, right? So for true innovation from India, thoughts, comments, suggestions, I'm going to uh, try to answer it at two levels. Uh, one, building on uh, Vanita's uh, concept. So this deeper uh, knowledge, body of knowledge in any domain, and um, uh, I have a bent on the hardware side, so I've done more of it in the hardware side, but, so I may give examples from that. But um, that's already there. We have a lot of it, uh, not only in the US, but in, in India, in our national labs, in our universities. What's missing is the critical mass of entrepreneurial DNA. So that gene pool is actually fairly limited. Who can recognize the value of that technology sitting on the shelf and go out and commercialize it. Aspects of what Padma talked about will materialize in the near term through that methodology. I'm a convinced believer of that. What is in shortfall, tremendous shortfall, is this gene pool of talent. So what does that mean? Let me take it to the second aspect of answering the question. So what happens is the recognition, or think of it as an intersecting Venn diagram, for those of you who still remember your set theory. Um, so you got technology, you got products that can be built with that technology, and then you have market opportunities. So that gene pool is able to recognize the intersecting point of those three circles and see if we can build a business uh, that can be monetized, can be scaled, and is commercially viable. Out of that is what I think we will generate the next Googles, the next, and beyond that. I mean, it's probably not the right expression. It'll be something that we haven't seen, we haven't foreseen. And here's where the biased statement is. There will be a swing back to hardware. That's great, and uh, KK, one question for you, and then for all of you wondering, when do I get to ask Padma a question? You are next, okay? So if you have a question, then just uh, maybe uh, 
you know, try to stand here in the middle. I'm not saying all of you need to line up. We're a small group. It's intimate. I'm just saying stand up so you're visible. So plan your question. But I have one question for uh, KK. KK, you are sort of a pioneering entrepreneur. A lot of people look up to you. You have achieved a scale of success that, uh, and, and on a rapid time frame before the these unicorns, uh, you know, sort of, yeah, <laughs> took up the PR space from uh, uh, Shraddha and whatnot, right? <laughs> so... Uh, and a lot of uh, entrepreneurs still come to you, right? So the question is, how much of that you go, uh, wow, you know, that's inspiring, innovating, and how much of that is more of the same? And what do you wish for from innovation, entrepreneurial ideas uh, for, you know, just the next decade or whatever time frame you choose? No, I'd like to really sort of put this in three classes. A lot of people who come and want to bounce off ideas I see almost 50% of them wanting to really replicate what has been successful outside. It's not really original thinking, but you just want to replicate because you're really driven by the whole notion of saying. I many times tell people that entrepreneurship is not a slot machine. So if you're really expecting money to come and invest at a high valuation and somebody going to raise your valuation because somebody else has done it successfully, that's not what entrepreneurship is about. I think you must be passionate about solving a real problem and have a money-paying customer. I think that's what uh, I think is important. But certainly there are people who I would think, if I really take a number on that, about three out of ten who are really passionate in terms of solving a real problem and many times looking at problems which are very relevant in the context of India. Again, just to quote one example, I've been mentoring a startup here in Bangalore, which is primarily in the space of building affordable healthcare for rural India, just in the space of blindness. And in the last four years, I think they've probably arrested 300,000 people from getting blind. If that help had not reached them, they would have probably done that. But that is a small number. The balance 20% is really people sometimes who just don't understand. It's a completely unviable idea. I'm not going to get a customer whether I try it out for one year or two years, but just don't sense that market sense. I think Mohan talked about that when diagram of intersection. People just don't get it. But I just want to get into entrepreneurship because I don't like my current boss and I want to do something. <laughs> so I'm getting into entrepreneurship. So that's really a sort of mix of people whom I meet. Thanks, Mohan. My name is Siddharth Gupta. Uh, I run a startup called Trebo Hotels. Uh, we are using technology to try and transform hospitality in the country, budget hospitality. Uh, thanks for having us here, uh, Vani, and thanks for the lovely talk, Padma. My question is about uh, mobile apps. Um, obviously, it's a very, very relevant and top of mind topic among startups these days, and it's, it's almost a prerequisite uh, for a startup to be successful, or it seems like to develop a good consumer app. But when I think about it, it sometimes feels like, you know, back in 1999 when I got my first desktop PC and, you know, it was a rage to download software from CNET or download.com and for, you know, playing media or to combine PDF files. And then came the browser and it all went away and it seemed so primitive. But today it seems that that mobile is now again full of those .exe type files, which are the apps now. Where do, how do you see the future of, of, of this way of interacting with the mobile? Do you think apps are here to stay forever? Or do you think there'll be a browser equivalent uh, 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 tool or, or a technology which unifies the experiences across, across apps? So I, it, again, this is my opinion. I'm not sure if this is going to be true or not. It, what is happening more and more is a lot is happening within the app, right? There is within the app purchasing, within the app um, uh, searching. If I, you know, what I mean by that is, again, I, I'm sorry I had to give you US examples, but that's the world I know best. Like if you're looking for a restaurant, and sorry to my friends in Google, you're not going to go to Google and search for a restaurant. You're going to go to Yelp and search for a restaurant, right? Now, if you're looking for a ride, you're going to go to Uber and look for a ride, not going to go to Google and say search for a ride. So I think there is a lot in, in specific things where there is a lot going on within the app. So you know, there is a notion that says there will be specialized app that will do everything for that app versus like going from app to app. So then now there's app searching, you know, so how do you search across these apps that will happen? So I'm not sure if we'll go to a broad browser for apps, but perhaps we'll figure out a way to 
create more value from within the app versus just going to an app for a specific thing and then having to come out of the app to go to another app to do something else. So will there be a connection to the apps like the browser would provide or something? I don't know, but I think the apps will become more self-sufficient in what they do. Um, maybe at some point in future you'll say, I need a ride, and there'll be someone that'll find the best ride for you versus you having to go to Uber and call for a ride. But then maybe that'll happen, and that would be like the browser equivalent. So, I, but I don't know if it'll be a browser. Bro you know, it's not a browser per se, right? But it'll serve that functionality in a different way. Fatma, we have Anjali here. She uh, ran uh, talent search for Spencer Stewart, and then now it's uh, TPG here in India. So, Anjali, do we have the managerial and the entrepreneurial talent for all of this innovation that uh, Fatma is talking about, and we are all hoping for? Otherwise, we don't have the job. Right. So, what do you think? Great question, Vani. And uh, so, I've actually kind of traversed a journey myself from sort of engineering. So, I was a very early lapsed engineer, went into finance and business, did consulting at McKinsey, and then got into the talent business because realizing that all these wonderfully elegant strategies that we deliver from McKinsey and so on actually need to be executed. So, that's, and then I continue on this. What we do now, and I do now in investing, is still a talent game, actually. What we are constantly looking for are great entrepreneurs who not only have brilliant ideas, but also have the ability to go to market, whether hardware or software model. But they can go to market, they can commercialize, whether it's technology or an idea, and build great companies. So India still has a little bit of a dearth of this kind of talent ecosystem. It is developing. I think there's more in Bangalore and more in technology. We'd love to see many more entrepreneurs emerge across industry sectors. Great. OK, somebody go solve the traffic problem in Bangalore. <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciate you taking time out. I know going anywhere in Bangalore is uh, really hard, but uh, I think to listen to Padma, it would uh, all be worth it. I think you all agree. So let's give a big hand to Padma and Mohan for spending the time. And uh, Padma, thank you so much. And uh, I'm so glad we got to spend this time. I learned a lot. And here is a small donation to Room to Read on your behalf. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care.